Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 899th New Social Environment. I'm Chloe Stagerman, Director of Programs here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Hearn Party and Amanda Millet Sorsa. We're thrilled to welcome poet Simon Pettit here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. Here in New York, we're on Lenape Hokang, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsee, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgments are not a replacement for necessary decolonial work, but serve as a reminder of place, of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustain and enrich the stolen land we are speaking from. And now to introduce today's guest and host, Artist and writer Hearn Party is based in New York and California. Party is a professor em emeritus at University of California, Davis. His paintings and collages explore everyday landscapes, including those on the Pacific Island of New Caledonia. He's a contributor to the Brooklyn Rail. And our host today, Amanda Millet Sorsa, is an artist, arts writer, and arts worker based in New York. She's exhibited at Below Grand Gallery, Socrates Sculpture Park, and elsewhere. She's a contributor to the Brooklyn Rail, a member of the International Association of Art Critics, and a curator at Below Grand on the Lower East Side. And with that, I'll pass it over to Amanda. Thank you, Chloe. And thank you to the whole team who make these lunchtime conversations possible every day of the week. I appreciate the invitation by Fong and the Brooklyn Rail to speak with Hearn today. And Hearn, thank you for joining us. I've been looking forward to discussing your work all week. Oh, thank you. <laughs> So I thought that we could um, start with uh, talking a little bit about your process. And uh, Chloe, if we could perhaps uh, switch out through uh, slides one through six as we begin the conversation. So Hearn, as we're looking at your work here, which we can see at Bowery Gallery, these works on paper um, begin with a line drawing with graphite, perhaps of a landscape or an interior or still life. And then these rectangular col colors are collaged on the foreground and is the, one of the first things we see. But in these particular works on paper, the landscape you're most looking at is an art installation in your local neighborhood near UC Davis called Just Seeing, which I think we have photographs of in slides four and five. Um, so we can get a sense of what Hearn is looking at here. Um, and so, how do you choose what becomes the subject of your focus when you are drawing in graphite, when you're looking at something? Could you perhaps tell us a little bit about how you begin? Um, well, it's a, primarily a spontaneous thing. I, I work from where I, I live and where I, I go for runs and I walk around and see things every day. So, um, so this is not like I go out specifically to look for a place. I, I usually see something in my... Uh, walking or running around that uh, attracts my attention. Now the light uh, seems to do something for me. And uh, lately I've been taking photographs, uh, but I've also gone out with my canvas and set up with a piece of paper uh, and then uh, take things back to the studio and work with collage. Uh, these things that you're going through here uh, comprise a couple of different processes. Uh, one of them, uh, diptych that we saw earlier, was made from a video. At one point I was... Uh, you know, I guess it's part, part of the process of not being able to decide exactly what to draw. I took a video camera and walked around the, the circuit of this little park with my video on. And I later sat in the studio and tried to draw from the video, thinking I was going to try to comprehensively take in the entire experience. And of course, that involved jumping around a lot. This is the video that's it's done with two pieces put together. But um, I discovered, you know, you could kind of jump around. And what intrigued me, I'm very interested in, uh, in the process of visual perception and the fact that we don't see things in total, the way the camera takes in a, an instantaneous view of everything. We look around shifting our attention from one thing to another. And working from the video as it was going by really forced me to be aware of that shift in attention because the video wouldn't stay there. And I had to kind of uh, improvise. This came later putting together some of the, the uh, video drawings 
And um, what I began thinking about was that the way we know, uh, I, was, I was interested in the idea that we know the landscape even though we don't see everything, we don't attend to everything in it. We feel like, oh yeah, I'm out in the park and I'm seeing it. And um, so what we know, I think, uh, is what uh, is sometimes called the gravity point. It's where, it's a tactile thing. It's where we feel the pressure of our feet on the ground and we know where we are. And we know that the, the world surrounds us. We know that we're in the midst of a, uh, of a space. We're a vertical, uh, the space is around us. This is kind of like Mondrian. He said, verticality is life and horizontality is death. So if you're standing <laughs> up and you feel your feet on the ground, you know you're alive at least. And you know, you know there is a, a three-dimensional space around you even though you can't see everything at once. Yeah. And, um, so that's kind of the challenge I put to myself was trying to see it all at once. And so by getting this grid going on there, I, that was kind of like the reference to the, the total space that I was aware of, but that I couldn't see. And the colored things I put in there, um, I felt were like filling in the spaces that I wasn't attending to, the things I wasn't aware of, um, that I didn't focus on, but I knew they were there and the color and the light was there. I mean, we're aware of immediacy of light that's all around us, even right. if we're not uh, seeing details. That's very interesting that you um, that you're working from video that you've taken as you're visiting these sites. Chloe, if we could see slides six and seven, we'll get a sense of what Hearn was looking at when taking the videos and of this um, installation, which is also the title of the exhibition at the gallery. Um, but looking back at the drawings, especially um, one through three, um, so Hearn, you you know, you said you said that you're you're working from a moving image, and that you're you're interested in these different modes of perception. So, what are you thinking about when you are drawing from these videos? What kind of decisions are you making when you're work, really working with that line? Well, it's really not making decisions. I don't have time to make decisions. I just look and I go from one one thing to the next. If I I get a line in one place and I see something that attracts my attention, it's it's, it's just. Uh, I think it must be something like the way we actually look around us when we're walking around. We're we're constantly not deciding to look at something, but we keep looking just to reassure ourselves of where things are and saying, "Oh yeah, there's this stuff over there," and "Oh, then there's that over there." You know, I'm I'm just constantly. It's like a state of constant distraction in a way. I should just say this uh, this thing. The photographs here are not what I was actually looking at. This is the basic structure. This was an installation. Uh, actually, the title of the installation is Evidence of Life, which was given to it by this artist, Sam Tubiolo, who's in Sacramento. And he was commissioned to put this uh, a public artwork into this park space that the city of Davis established after they had destroyed a, a burrowing owl habitat, which was out there in that field. A real estate developer came in and plowed it up and got rid of all the burrowing owls. And the neighbors were so outraged that they forced the city to create a park. And so this was just the beginning where they had cleared the space and put the park, uh, which didn't leave enough space for the burrowing owls, but they put a lot of native vegetation out there. And so Sam, the artist recently sent me these pictures. He said, this is what it looked like at the start. And it's set up like a solstice thing that's rock right in the middle. You can sit on there and the, the, the next photograph shows what happens if you're there at the right time on a summer or winter solstice. You see the rock across from you align with the sun. And there's a rock way out there in the distance on the other side of the park that he's also set up, which creates this kind of distant uh, orientation to the, to the cosmos. Uh, of course, now it's all overgrown. And he said, well, you can't see anything. And I knew that was going to happen, but I know it's there. And to me, this sort of uh, exemplifies the kind of experience of space that I'm interested in, where we're layering different spaces on top of one another. He knows the rock is out there. He can't see it right now. Uh, just the same way we know that the other side of an apple we're looking at is there, uh, even though we can't see it. Um, I'm interested in how we, uh, we mm -hmm. see in three dimensions, really, not just that flat plane that we're taught to look at uh, in some drawing classes. Right. And and yet, um, drawing from observation in situ or whether in situ or in the with these moving images is integral to your practice, right? Right. And I started out very much, um, well, I went to the New York Studio School and uh, I actually didn't want to sit in the studio. I went out and started painting on the street. I got a, a, an easel I could carry around and I, I started working outdoors way back then. 
and uh, that's like 50 years ago now, I think. And I still do it. I, I'm, just, uh, I'm intrigued with how you see colors and, and how difficult it is. Um, I, I get very frustrated with my phone camera, which constantly imposes its own idea of what the colors are gonna be. Um, I was reading something, actually, I just remembered this thing from Raoul Coutard, the famous videographer who worked with Godard. And he has this uh, statement about how uh, daylight is has the uh, inhuman property of always being perfect. And uh, remarks on how when we're in a room, we can look to the depths of the shadows in the room and then switch over to the window. And our eyes perform that feat perfectly normally. We, we stay in focus and see it because a camera can't do that. And uh, you know, my iPhone is constantly trying to figure out how to do that by imposing its own, uh, you know. Uh, right. Anyway, that so I'm still fascinated with working from observation, but I, right. I carry it on to a ridiculous degree, maybe. <laughs> right. And um, but, you know, I mean, working from observation is is how we get to see if we can go back to the works on paper um, that there is um, a serious dedication to that way of looking, of that way of perceiving, as you said, to see the back of the apple um, and. So are there certain artists that you think about when starting these drawings? You've mentioned that Cezanne's work has been influential to your practice. Yeah, Could you tell us a little bit more about this relationship? Yeah, well, Cezanne was uh, my first uh, real revelation. Actually, a lot of the little colored papers come from the fact that I started out with the Albers color course when I was an undergraduate. And I hadn't really thought about art before. And I took that course and suddenly I became aware of light. And I became aware of the fact that paintings were about light and color and not just pictures of things. And uh, I, I got really good at the little colored papers you would paste down in the Albers color course. So as I got out uh, and tried to make away from myself, I, uh, I started going back to that and combining the colored papers with the drawings, uh, more observational drawings as a way to uh, uh, you know, carry them forward. And I, I was influenced by a lot of people um, at the studio school. Stanley Lewis was a, a, an artist who paints frenetically from observation. Um, I also studied with Philip Guston, who was still teaching uh, at the school at that point. Now, this is a little different here. This one's a um, looking down at a collage on the floor with these rocks and, and water uh, vase uh, put on top of it. We'll get to the water later on when I get more into this Asian influence. but. Um, this is also about looking and relating later to the choreographer I work with who, who pointed out to me how we always look straight ahead and think of ourselves as uh, oriented towards that frontal view, but actually dancers fall down and go over backwards. And uh, you know you have to be prepared to move in all different directions when you're uh, moving around. And uh, of course, we're moving around all the time and seeing things looking down and looking up. So I put the, uh, this is a collage on the ground, which we'll see later and another form when it's on the wall. And I took a picture of it just because I wanted to uh, disorient people a little bit and say, what is this? You know, we're looking down all of a sudden instead of looking at it uh, right. on the wall. I love that you've um, you've had all of these absolute legends as educators in your formative years. Um, I hope that we can talk about it a little bit later. I was later. very lucky in my <laughs> time. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> we want to know all about it. Uh -huh. but, um, but as far as Cezanne goes, um, could you talk a little I didn't, bit? Uh, I didn't study with Cezanne. I missed him. <laughs> you missed him as, yes. as in most of us. But what, what was that, that relationship <laughs> like work that was seminal to how you kind of have approached um, your body of work? Could you say that again? I was... what, I, what I was hoping that you could artist. speak a bit more about is, um, what is what is it about Cezanne and, and his work that has been seminal about how you're approaching your work? Well, I think uh, the, the basic uh, idea of, of working directly and, uh, and the way he, he worked with space, uh, I think, you know, Merleau-Ponty is important to me and, you know, his essay on Cezanne's doubt and the uh, idea of putting things together bit by bit uh, I really responded to that. And then uh, later to Matisse, I, I felt Matisse is really the artist I felt most, uh, um, he was, uh, you know, equally important, I think. Uh, but the idea of, of Cezanne, I think, was important to me with the idea of working from observation and how you could do something with something from observation to make a rather profound statement and not just a, 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 a notation of some visual uh, image that went by as you were walking around. So that's the uh, intention. Okay. 
Thank you. And and so um, you mentioned that you you started to bring in color after kind of, after having this um, course by one of Joseph Albers' disciples on color, and that really started to mm -hmm. come into your work in an important way. And so we can observe these collaged papers that have uh, different kinds of palettes that we can see that you're cutting in irregular rectangular shapes in verticals, and we can see the unevenness of the human hand, and yet they're arranged in these very grid-like forms, and they're at the forefront of what is uh, an observational drawing. Um, mm -hmm. Where do these colors come from, and what do these collage colors mean to you? You also say that there is something about the, gravi the gravity point that these strips of paper provide for you in the work right the 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 strips of paper the verticals are really sort of like uh you know projecting myself into the space as though i'm standing in that position they're a little like uh a choreography in a way you could see all these as people standing in different places in front of you in a space and the colors come more uh by accident uh, I mean, one of the things from the Albers color course is that you weren't supposed to have favorite colors. You didn't, you didn't, you didn't get to choose really your favorite colors. You would learn to look at whatever was in front of you, and make something out of that. And so I, um, uh, I make, uh, I make up colors. I'll go through a phase where I'm just, I need more colored paper, so I'll just start mixing colors and painting paper and um, using some colors that I've liked. You know, I do kind of get into a thing where I like certain colors and start making more of them because I've used it up. But uh, mostly it's, uh, it, it's, it's kind of a random thing. And I use, I use what's on the floor. A lot of my work, uh, the papers end up on the floor when I'm working. And I see a couple of things that attract my eye and I say, well, maybe I could put them in and I'll just pick them up. And I, I work on the wall with push pins. So uh, if you see my work in person, you'll notice there are all kinds of holes in the collages and that's because I keep moving the paper around. Right. Yeah. Um, and so here we can see in this work um, a still life that has entered from going outside into the external world and, and the environments that surround you. And there is this interior still life that we can see in slides seven through 11. Chloe, if we can go through the paintings. And uh, so there's a, in, uh, uh, there's a stool, there are some rocks and a kind of a glass jar with water in it. Could you let us know what is the meaning behind the still life and how you move from exterior okay. to exterior? I'll try uh, and elaborate on that. Uh, the, the still life with the rocks and the water came from an assignment I gave to my class, actually, when I was teaching. It ultimately goes back to an assignment that Wayne Tebow, who was teaching at Davis uh, when we first got there, uh, gave his class, which is to take a glass of uh, a clear plastic glass and half full of water, put it on a white piece of paper and force the students to paint that. And I thought this was such a brilliant idea. It was so easy um, that I took it over. And then I was trying to get my students, who are many of them Asian in descent, uh, to think more about Asian art because they complain that we talk only about uh, Matisse and Cezanne and Western artists. And so um, I was influenced by this uh, book. I was referred to uh, Francois Ching, uh, a student of Lacan, actually, who came from China, learned French, and became an authority writing about uh, the philosophy and uh, history of Chinese painting. And um, I was just uh, very superficial. I noticed Emily Cheng is in the audience, and I hate to say anything uh, about Chinese philosophy, but uh, he emphasizes the importance of mountains and water as fundamental uh, subjects and, and connection to the breath. I was uh, I like that too because uh, I'm very influenced by the idea of you know as you stand and you feel gravity your body is engaged it's not just your eye your whole body should be engaged in the uh, in in your uh, and you're looking as I say looking as opposed to seeing and so um, I put up this uh, I added to the glass of water I added the rocks and just told the students this was an Asian landscape they were looking at. And uh, they did some really interesting work that way. And I got intrigued with it and started working in the studio. Uh, I took some of the stuff down to my studio and started working on that. And that became a, a whole thing. And I began really being interested in water and reflections and transparency and all those things that are very fun to work with as a painter. Right. And so there seems to be this move from the exterior world to the interior world of your studio. You're bringing in rocks and water right. to the outside, but also the environment that you're surrounded by that you're recording and with the moving image 
So could you tell us a little bit more about this move from interior to exterior, which we also see as hybrids in your painting? We see elements of that landscape with those uh, collage strips of color, but also the interior in your studio. Could you tell us a little bit more about how- Well, well, well this painting was a very deliberate effort after I had been working with the, uh, the setup in the studio and also outdoors. I, I took a painting, I started outdoors and worked on it. I put the, the stool and the water and the rocks on top of that. And then I took it back outdoors and worked on it, kind of going back and forth between um, my idea with working with these uh, collages in the background is that I'm actually painting the landscape. This is sort of a conceit, I guess you could say. When I when I make up this landscape abstracted into just these uh, vertical strips of paper, I put that on the wall and then I can say, okay, I'm painting the landscape because I'm looking at it. It's from observation. And then I have this other stuff in front of it. So it's really the landscape. But in the case of the one we were looking at before, I went out and actually literally worked from the landscape and would take colors like one of the greens from the uh, from the collage and, and put that green into some of the plants that I was painting in the landscape. And, and so that way they began to develop as a, you know, collaborative sort of thing between the uh, indoor and the outdoor. And I, I don't uh, give it a great philosophical thing like I'm working, you know, with some interior vision or something like that. I think I'm, uh, I'm very uh, interested in kind of subjective uh, vision and, and things that happen um, purely uh, that a lot of accidents that happen with the collage, but um, I'm, uh, you know, generally I just, I just like to play around with the colors. Okay. And so you spent most of your career on the West Coast as a, now a professor emeritus at UC Davis. Well, I should say I started out in Maine, actually. I spent 10 years in Maine in the 80s. And I was very influenced there by Marsden Hartley. And uh, I got involved since that, that was, he was a painter from Maine. So I, I got looking at Marsden Hartley and he was a fascinating character going back and forth. I was really concerned at that point with trying to, how do I re reconcile Cezanne and Matisse with American painting? And, uh, and so I found examples in the Stieglitz group. And in that idea of working from the local landscape, how do you make the... Uh, uh, American landscape over into something worthy of art without trying to make it look like uh, the Alps or something, you know, European. So, uh, so that that contributed a lot. California became the suburbs. That became a whole new everyday <laughs> experience when we got to California. And so the landscape really influences how you, what you're painting or how you're painting. Um, yeah, you can say does that. it change? Does it change from one location to the other? Do are your color choices different depending where you are, or well, how would you say yeah, that difference? It's it's very much. I, I don't know that they change that much. I mean, I'm sure they do. As I look over my work, I've worked in a lot of different places, and the the work changes. But I'm uh, I I think I'm probably pretty conservative in the kinds of things I like in colors. And uh, probably somebody could tell that it was me, you know, even if I'm painting like the mountains in Yosemite or, or the main coast, I could be. Uh... Anyway, I, I, uh, I'm influenced by the local thing, but, but not, uh, I don't analyze it that much, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Right, right. And so uh, you mentioned Mars and Hartley and uh, so many great you know, artists in history. Are there contemporary artists that you think about in dialogue with your work that you'd well, like to think about? Um, I've been involved with a lot of, looking at a lot of different people. Um, I'd say Josephine Halverson is one who comes to mind for her interest in the particular kind of subjects that, uh, that I'm drawn to. And uh, her uh, intense work from observation, she has an amazing power of concentration, which I envy. And, um, She's worked with things where she uses the uh, the actual land. She takes the the dirt from where she's working and uh, makes surfaces out of that. So I'm uh, I'm very interested in that. But I'm but I'm also drawn to more uh, you know uh, people I guess like Bill Jensen who has influence from a lot of different uh, sources in in Asia and Europe and uh, a very intense involvement just with the materials of painting. That's the uh, uh, one thing that I feel is important, you know, to be uh, deeply engaged with painting. Um, right. Yeah, yeah, we can we can definitely see that engagement in your work, and um, and I think you've also mentioned that Gabriel Orozco's work has had an impact on you. 
Yeah, that's a little different because I don't know if you would say that he's deeply engaged with painting. He kind of engages with painting in a way that's very intriguing to me. I, I really got interested in his work and especially in the idea of moving from uh, painting into sculpture, uh, which I see in this effort to, to, you know, to get around behind the apple and see what's there. Uh, he has a he uses the the, the term gravity point and um, is involved with he loves to play chess and the idea of the the knight's move the way the knight jumps in a diagonal way over uh, opposing uh, pieces uh, and goes into three dimensions from the two dimensional grid uh, he sees that as a basic move into sculpture and so I'm fascinated with that I mean his his relation to painting is is it's almost he wants to paint without actually making a painting. I'm not sure exactly how he does these things. A lot of it is sort of uh, made with prints and, and other techniques. But um, I, uh, I find him very informative. And when we had our dialogue, which was in the rail recently, uh, I asked him about Matisse. And he came into Matisse through Japanese art, where he spent a lot of time in Japan and, uh, and talking about how Matisse was also sculptural. And um, we're, you know, interested in the the Red Studio, that exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art recently. Uh, we talked about uh, how that uh, is sort of like one of his work tables. It has, uh, you know, all the elements of the uh, art process involved. Right. That's a fantastic piece. And, um, and also a nice transition into talking about the three-dimensional, the evolution that your, your work has taken. Here we can see um, some digital prints of some of your surrounding neighborhood in California. Um, and we can see these uh, collaged swatches of color as well. And I think, Chloe, if we go to um, slide 14, yeah, we can see the sculptures that have also been placed on these digital images. We can see elements of that color and that kind of collage paper now becoming a sculptural form within our world. And as you mentioned before, um, you have lately collaborated with a choreographer, David Grenke, and placed digital images of your work onto the floor, which we can see um, slides 17 through 21. And later this month, this month, actually, there will be a performance at Bowery Gallery with the choreographer's piece and your work, which we can all attend and we can send out information um, for those of us who are in New York. So Hearn, could you speak more about how this evolution into the three dimension evolved in your work? Yes, well, it, it, it happened um, partly, uh, well, David Grenke was a colleague in the theater and dance department just next door to us in the art department. And um, I was teaching a, a life drawing class and I uh, asked if I could bring my students to draw his dancers as they were rehearsing. And he was perfectly eager to show us that and talk about uh, his relationship to dance. And um, he said he, he had seen some of my work, he liked it, he wanted to, to visit the studio and, and he came and looked and I had work kind of on the ground, on the walls, uh, a lot of these sort of uh, papers I was making up with colors. And um, he said, well, you know, I could use some of this to put out uh, when I'm doing choreography and I could have my dancers uh, move around with your uh, he liked these as kind of spatial uh, suggestions of, uh, you know, space on the floor, space around them. They did some projections where they had uh, photographs of these that were projected on the wall. This is in the theater at, at Davis where we had some of these on the floor. He protected them nicely with plastic. But what we went on to do was we realized it's hard to move these things around. Uh, so I took photographs of the works and then we printed them on vinyl. So the works in the gallery now are vinyl uh, digital prints of the uh, of these large collage uh, compositions that I made, and uh, and that works fine because you can walk on them or spill stuff on them and it uh, comes right off, and they're easy to move around. So uh, so Dave came into the gallery and he rolled unrolled these uh, vinyl things that we had made uh, and Davis and arranged them. I mean he's a Choreographers are great. They really know how to use space. He put them down on the floor of the gallery in a way that uh, better than I could have, uh, arranging them in different directions. And so um, the idea is that we'll have his three three dancers and a narrator. I'm not sure the narrator is going to read a text, so it'll be uh, a multimedia experience. And um, the idea that the gallery will be the stage. There won't be any uh, chairs set up for the audience. People will mingle 
and the dancers will move around according to the scenario that he's created, but they'll be sitting some on the floor like this, sometimes interacting with the work on the floor, looking at the works on the walls. Um, you know, I took this one at a kind of angle just to emphasize, again, that idea that we're looking at things from all different points of view. Uh, so that's going to happen on the 23rd. And uh, I, I've always been interested in the idea of collaborating with dance, like Matisse, of course, painted that famous painting of the dance. And the thing that uh, struck me about that is that after he did that painting, he said it was a climax of luminosity. He didn't talk about it as a triumph of depicting human figures in motion, but about luminosity. And as though the light is the important thing, it's the overall experience of light. Like I say, when you're in a space, you see the light everywhere. And uh, that's sort of what he was really aiming for. And his, uh, you know, his decorations always want to expand onto the wall and uh, take over more of the space that we're living in. So I think it's natural, a dance and the way that dance is an experience in movement um, and, uh, our vision is also usually in movement. We're, we're looking at things as we move around and um, with our body uh, involved. So, uh, so it seems very natural to have uh, collaborations between dancers and, uh, and painters. And Dave Brinke, worked, he, he worked with David Sally when David Sally was working with Carol Armitage and Dave was working with her. And then he was with Paul Taylor and uh, experienced you know, the, the, the dialogue between Paul Taylor and Alex Katz about, about dance. So we're, we're looking at things a little different. It's not like the, the, the visual stuff is just a decor or something, but rather mm -hmm. something that it's actually part of the overall experience. That's really such a revelation. I, lo I love that link about the dance and the luminosity being more about that than the figure. Yeah, that came as a surprise when I, I, I was just, I, I was actually just <laughs> looking at uh, stuff about uh, Matisse uh, and I came across that the other day. So I thought, wow, um, he's really interested in light. And that's, yeah. that's kind of, well, I guess, well, uh, you know, I can say, well, I started out with that with the Albers color problems, you know, just look at the right. light. And so, and so how did the conversation with the choreographer and the dancers evolve? Uh, was there an understanding that it would be around light or what, what was it about your works that they were responding? Well, it's, it's more about the space, the layering of spaces. Uh, you know, the fact that each of us is looking at different spaces in different ways. The, the the three dancers will be moving around and seeing different things, but that all these, we're, we're aware of spaces uh, that are all kind of happening simultaneously. We're, uh, you know, we're, like I say, looking at the back of the apple, we're, we're aware of all the spatial uh, layers that go into a uh, our, our experience of the world. And so each of these dancers will be with their own spatial orientation and, uh, that, that's kind of what we've been talking about is kind of, maybe it's a kind of futurist cubist idea of everything kind of overlapping and intersecting. And, uh... Right. And um, and so if we go back to the, these pieces that you said that you were making on the floor, could you, could you give us a little bit more insight into well, what was this, happening here? This piece is an earlier one that I did. This kind of came directly out of that very first thing we looked at with the vertical lines and the drawing. After I discovered that I had I had suddenly represented the entire space just with the just the grid. You know, that's all I needed. That showed me where I was in space and it included everything. And I didn't have to go out and draw and look at anything in detail. So I made, uh, uh, I was making groups of four things because I liked the idea of looking Northeast, South and West, you know, the four cardinal directions. And these were done, I said, I'll incorporate color. So I'll just make it like the, you know, the print colors, like the red, the, cyan and the blue or the green and, and then black and white. And I painted these, these are actually painted pieces of paper and I put them on the wall and then I painted them over again with an oil painting. So I was, uh, this was like, you know, super, uh, super conceptual in a way like saying, I am actually painting a landscape from observation by looking at these colored paper <laughs> things that I've made in the, in the studio. And you can actually see there's a little bit of variation that the, the four pieces of white paper weren't exactly white, you know, so I was trying to make those distinctions. Again, uh, this is done not just through my camera and through the projector and everything. So this is not really what they look like, but they were trying to be different <laughs> in each of those uh, four sections is supposed to have a different kind of background. Uh, but this is, uh, but I had gotten to this point and I felt like, well, I was almost uh, making myself irrelevant here. You know, what do I have to paint anymore? Just pieces of paper on a wall. So that's when I began really working more with the uh, the rocks and the water. Uh, I welcomed that 
and say, well, yeah, this is kind of philosophically like that. You know, it's an openness to, uh, I think uh, Francois Cheng's book is about emptiness and fullness, uh, the language of Chinese painting. So I said, well, this is about emptiness, but I can make that emptiness real with a, with a, uh, a vase of water. And that's got the emptiness, but, uh, and I think the thing about, as I understand Asian philosophy, the emptiness is really kind of in the middle where uh, lots of things are happening. It's not about uh, a void. And so um, I began developing this. This became kind of the extreme, I guess, that I went to with the uh, trying to, maybe it's the extreme I went to when I was thinking more about Mondrian and about uh, eliminating everything that wasn't essential. And then I realized, well, I want to put some things in there still. I want to be deeper involved with painting and not, uh, as Mondrian kind of did too when he started doing Broadway Boogie Woogie, he got much more involved than with his uh, austere uh, earlier work. Right, and we can see that in your paintings, if we could see some of those again, please. Um, and your paintings... Oh. Um, well, this one, this one's that collage that was on the floor that I did the picture of. But yeah, this is the... Uh, uh, you know, good example of the uh, combination of the uh, of the abstracted landscape, which isn't totally abstract. Uh, it's still got it's it's a picture of a collage, basically, but it's also a landscape. Right. And it's got the uh, uh, the elements of the rocks and the water. And so, do your do the um, the strips of color um, point to a kind of movement in your work, like you were hinting at as far as the dance and the, the light goes? Um, I don't, uh, I'm uh, I'm still pretty much uh, in love with the idea of the, of the vertical and horizontal of the grid. And uh, if I can add color, these uh, where, where it gets on the floor, I'm intrigued with the idea of, uh, again, kind of shifting our point of view where you're looking down at something and, and trying to connect it. Here it starts to get more uh, overlapping between the uh, the floor and the wall, and uh, I'm uh, definitely now beginning to add collage to the paintings. I've decided that was a rule I I decided I would break, and uh, so now I think I can open up the oil paintings to more of a collage, uh, uh, get more complicated sort of. I, I can think of it as kind of dance forms, you know, movements. Uh, in three dimensions uh, going with these uh, compositions. So maybe it won't be totally linear so much. It'll be more uh, areas of color. Right. And we can kind of see that in that work on paper with the Mobius strip. I think that's slide mm -hmm. 15. Um, I think there are two that you placed with the, the Mobius strip is a yeah. is, a, uh, is a, a link to Gabriel Orozco, who uh, again, like the Knights move the Mobius strip, it starts in two dimensions and turns into three dimensions and stays, it's all basically one surface. So um, uh, he's intrigued with that. And I thought that was a great idea. And, and this one, which is the one I photographed lying on the floor here, I picked it up and put it on the wall in the gallery. Uh, but the Mobius strips there kind of allude to that process of uh, turning around and falling down that uh, Dave Brinke was uh, trying to encourage me to uh, think more about and uh, not be so focused on the, the the thing in front of me. Right. And um, and so now going back to some of your um, formative years with these legends and the history of art that have been your teachers, you um, you were taught by you were a student of Meyer Shapiro. Of Hans Hoffman <laughs> and of Philip um, Dustin. Um, I didn't actually know Hans Hoffman, but I did. I did study with Meyer Shapiro, who complicated okay. it a great deal with all of his uh, thoughts. <laughs> and so I'm curious, what what did you learn from Meyer Shapiro? Oh uh, well, I took. Uh, well, I uh, I learned a great deal. Just I read his book about Cezanne. I mean, that was a revelation to me. The way he had described the paintings of Cezanne. Uh, I, my my teacher in the Albers Color Course hated that book. I said, I read this book by Meyer Shapiro. He says, I threw that book across the room when I read it. And he didn't think these art historians should say anything about color. But um, but I was very uh, seduced by the whole thing. And uh, I, I took Meyer's courses in medieval, Romanesque. I, love, I got very involved with Romanesque sculpture and uh, sort of my sculpture kind of has some connection to that maybe. But... Um, I, I just was fascinated with his, you know, just his intellect and, and the, the way he brought so many diverse perspectives to bear on things. 
And uh, and so, I, it, but I like I say, it kind of slowed me down in a way because I came to him after Gustin, and instead of throwing myself full force into painting like Gustin, I, I spent a lot of time in the library and, and looking at medieval art, which was a totally uh, mm. different thing. Maybe now I'm doing the same thing, going with Asian art or something. I'm getting out of the out of the track. And but, for us, and and for us who didn't have the the chance to ever be a student of Mara Shapiro's. Uh, could you perhaps describe to us what that was like? Oh, you know? well, he was just a uh, very generous. I mean, I could go in and talk to him in his office. I was I was terrified to go into his office, but he would sit down and talk to me and he would, uh, you know, show me things. And uh, he was interested in my work. He, he would look at my work and uh, give me some suggestions, like maybe you're using too many small things. He was very formal in the ways. Maybe he thought the collages, I was using too many small things. And, what, do you, uh, what do you mean by small things? Well, that I needed to kind of bring together larger forms, you know, and not break up attention with all the little pieces of paper, uh, too many different little pieces of paper. He wanted more simple. He he did work himself, which uh, I put together a show at the studio school ones that, that included some of his uh, works. He did some drawings and paintings, and uh, they were very much about well, he had this idea. He wrote a, a I think, a, an article called "Field and Frame," which is very influential. I, I use that title from one of my shows. Uh, that the semiotics of visual art. I mean, that's actually, yeah, that's really uh, relevant in a way. He talked about the field and the frame and the material elements that go to make up uh, uh, an image. Uh, he was influenced by Saussure and structuralism at that point. He was trying to apply that to uh, to visual uh, images. And uh, the material, the uh, the arrangement was the left side different from the right side. All these basic kind of distinctions that you could make about uh, the visual field, and mm -hmm. um, so that that did have a big impact on on my thinking and on this kind of simplification. But he he was you know very interested in that kind of formal thing, um, but also just a very generous human being. I mean, he would he would be interested in what I was doing and. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, I like I say I was very fortunate to intersect with some of these people who were willing to to relate to me and not just be eminent. And and, and what was it about Romanesque art that was of interest to you? Uh, I think just the spot. Well, actually, he wrote Meyer Shapiro wrote a book about uh, or an article about the breaking down of uh, frames. There was a guy Jurgen Baltrizaitis who was an art historian who had written about the sort of like the organization of Romanesque art being based on developments of the frame and the ornamental uh, patterns. And Meyer said, that's ridiculous. You know, the Romanesque artist is breaking through. This was kind of coming out of his Marxism, I guess. The idea was to break out of the frames. And he cited a lot of examples. There's a, some wonderful things like in Vesale, the tympanum, the, the exuberance of the apostles break through the frame and they go from one frame up into the next frame. Uh, so uh, I love that kind of stuff. I was really intrigued with the uh, uh, formal uh, formal invention of medieval art, uh, and he really uh, he really brought that uh, uh, very much into the discussion at that time with uh, combining Marxism and semiotics, I guess. Mm -hmm. And um, and then and then how was it like to be with Philip Guston? Then what did you what did you learn from him? Well, he he was just a uh, uh, I uh, I don't know that I intellectually well it it wasn't an intellectual discussion. He said, well, he would talk about painting. You know, he would rave about you know Piero della Francesca or whoever he was particularly looking at, and everybody would talk about how great it was, and uh, and he'd look at your work and and say in that respect, you know, this is you know, right over here. I really like how you're doing that. It was sort of like coaching and inspiration, just sort of pushing uh, pushing us to to develop ideas and to, uh, to, to allow ourselves to do more. Uh, he, uh, you know, he, like I say, encouraged me to work bigger and to uh, improvise more with the work I had started doing outdoors. Mm -hmm. He incidentally told me that I never would go back to the outdoor landscapes after I painted this big painting in his class. And I, I secretly said, I don't know about that. You know, I'm, I'm not sure. I didn't want to give up on that uh, impulse to paint, uh, looking at things outdoors. And uh, he also, he criticized my work sometimes for being decorative. And I think it was partly that big areas of color. Uh, he, he wanted it to be more uh, intense or, or visceral or something, I guess. And, and I think that was kind of a legacy of the Albers thing, which uh, people at the studio school criticized Albers for being too much of the head and not enough with the 
Albert said he didn't, or my teacher at least said that he didn't want any grunters and groaners in his class. He wanted to cut us off at the neck, just have eyes and brains. And uh, and so the studio school was kind of opposed to that. Hans Hoffman was very much about uh, about rhythmic movement, and he was really in the bodily uh, engagement. <laughs> so uh, so I would th th those were kind of the two poles of my uh, education in the art business. And how did you bring yourself to open your your work up to improvisation? Uh, well, I think it was just uh, I got uh, to a point where I felt like I could try something, and and Gustin was important to me because he he said, "Great, go ahead, do more, make that bigger." Uh, he, uh, I, I I just put a I actually put a a line in the sky of a, a, a kind of rectangle that came in that I just felt like I needed something there, so I did it. He said, "Oh, that's interesting. Can you do that again?" And uh, so I went out and tried it again on another bigger painting. And uh, that's how my work progressed with him. And I opened up, you know, all these possibilities, which um, which I've only explored really in a very limited way. I think he, he, he was right to say, maybe I shouldn't have gone back to paint outdoors. I was limiting myself, but um, who knows? I'm opening back up again now. So maybe it's taken me 30 or 40 years to get around to his advice. It does seem like all these interests of yours in sculpture and dance are opening new avenues for your work. Um, but um, also there, there is, um, if we go to the last two slides, Chloe, um, I believe that you mentioned that Wayne Tebow was a dear colleague of yours. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, he was a, a peer and a colleague and both of you spoke a lot about painting um, as you taught at Davis. Uh, yeah, he was... Um... He was actually involved with the studio school, Mercedes Matter. Uh, she got a lot of criticism for her abstract expressionist colleagues who didn't think Wayne Tebow was a serious artist. But uh, he, she brought him to the studio school to teach a couple of times. And so uh, when we went to Davis, it was like seeing an old friend. And he was right up the road in Sacramento and was uh, very eager to talk about. He had a great art collection and he loved to talk about um, what he was working on and what we were working on. And, uh, and like I say, he was still teaching at Davis. He would come in and teach one course uh, every year. Uh, and he, he was already uh, almost 80 years old when we got there. And he, um, uh, that's where I saw him doing this class with the, uh, with the water glass. And then this is a, a painting uh, in the retrospective show they put together after his death at the age of 101 a couple of years ago. I, I didn't know he was still gonna be around for 20 years when we moved to Davis, but we had that opportunity to uh, to share our opinions with him and to uh, show him pictures of things we had seen in New York. Uh, I thought this, the, the talk about, you know, looking, uh, this painting of, of glasses, uh, each one of those glasses has a, has a little landscape in the lens. And uh, it's as though each, you know, this is like everybody's particular vision of, of the world. Um, and it's also, you know, going back to that, the students actually found that, that cup, if you go back one to where the, the water, water cup that he painted, and I can't believe, I looked at it and said, is that oil in there or something? It doesn't look like water, but you can get into that when you're working, you know, you get into these colors and he loved light and color. I mean, that was his connection. Uh, he was, uh, in many ways, I felt like, uh, you know, I, I, he did not really come out of the same aesthetic as Matisse and Cezanne. Uh, he was much more involved with American, uh, you know, realist. Uh, he liked Western artists and people who were just good illustrators, really. He, he would really appreciate that, uh, which I think is something that gets lost. He, he critiqued a lot of pop artists because he said they weren't that good at design and illustration, which is what pop art was supposed to be about. Um, and he, uh, uh, so he, he was always saying, I felt like he felt like he had an art director over his shoulder. Uh, so he was very, uh, you know, uh, conservative in some ways, but uh, but then these things are are really kind of uh, uh, fun to look at for me and and inspired uh, my own efforts to go ahead and take these uh, water glasses more seriously. Yeah, that's great that you were able to talk to each other about your work in that way. Yeah, I saw that in your blog um, when he passed um, as a short homage to him. You you quoted him about some some things that you had discussed together, and I'm going to read it here. Um, he said that he was always skeptical of grandiose claims for quote art. Wayne once commented that art would indeed save the world, not with quote heroic gestures, but with quote nuances of fact. 
I wish we could talk more about all this, you said. So what what did he mean and what do you how do you understand how could art save the world and how do you understand these nuances of fact? I, I, I love that quote and uh, just uh, it's his modesty and he was always just saying so I'm just a painter and uh, people would introduce him as an artist if he'd say I'm a painter and uh, was very uh, engaged with that uh, material, you know, just the process of working. Uh, and uh, and I think he believed uh, that, uh, you know, so much, he, I mean, he had been through the 80s and all the hype of all the huge paintings and, the, uh, the you know, he, he uh, was very skeptical of his own uh, position uh, being a, a celebrated artist and his works going at, for millions of dollars at auction. Uh, he, he, he didn't really, he was, he was basically a, a very humble person who did not, very modest about his own efforts and and didn't think that he was uh you know worthy of all the attention he was getting uh but he uh, well i mean he certainly thought he was okay but he didn't uh go out for being grandiose and i think his uh belief in painting was basically that 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 we'll get somewhere if we keep paying attention to things and not if we're um uh, you know trying to make some grandiose gesture and what is your and what is your belief in painting well, pretty much, uh, as I say, just looking. Uh, that's what I'm trying to say with this show, I think, is that it's it's about looking, but also extending the looking uh, to the idea of uh, movement, obviously here with dance and the and the, the idea that 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 uh, that dancing is looking too, that dancing is experiencing the fullness of uh, of the visual world in a in its own way. Uh, there are all different kinds of uh, uh, ways of uh, exploring the visual world. And dance is certainly a, uh, another interesting way to do that. Right. Well, thank you, Hearn. That was um, a really great discussion about your work. Um, thank you. I'm glad I got to talk about so much. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think that there are a lot of questions from you know this audience that we have here listening. Thank you all for joining. Um, please feel free to ask your questions and uh, the team will mediate. Thank you so much, Amanda and Hearn. That was such a generous conversation and I really enjoyed hearing about the work. Thank you both. Um, we do have several questions. So the first is gonna be from Nancy. Nancy, I'll give you the chance to unmute and ask your question directly. Hi, Hearn, and thank you to the Brooklyn Rail. Um, I'm calling from Chautauqua, New York, where uh, just a comment before I ask my question that I met Stanley Lewis through Don Kimes and your wife, Gina, who I went to Kirkland College with. Oh, wow. And it's just really a thrill to have this opportunity. Um, I didn't expect it. And it's great. Um, I, I find that this subject matter is completely uh, in sync with everything I'm doing now. I'm taking a physics class I never took. And I, I hear you talk a little bit that way, our book club just finished Leonardo da Vinci by Walter Isaacson, and it's all about his curiosity, his looking. Um, mine is a practical question. You, you said you'd been criticized uh, a little bit for being decorative. Um, I know Gina has produced through a, a partnership with um, someone, some beautiful rugs of her colorful work. Is that anything that you might be getting into? Well, I should say I did do a... Uh... A public art piece. I know the uh, the rug guy. Actually, he was a former student of ours from Colby, who, who deals in rugs now. But I got to do a public art commission in Sacramento, where I put some of my work on a wall, uh, printed on uh, in uh, on stainless steel uh, with porcelain and fired. And it's uh, so it. I, I got a chance to put my work out there in the in the suburban world around uh, in Sacramento. And I also, I use the colors, the little color pieces to make tiles for a table. So there's like a picnic table next to the wall that uses the colors from the painting to make a pattern that people can sit and look at. So it's the idea of drawing people's attention. And this was done in that, that same park in Davis where the colors, I mean, it's, it's dry, it's not particularly bright colors, but you know, color is color. And uh, I threw in some more brighter colors too, I guess. Uh, I do have a preference for bright colors. I like to put things in to uh, energize things. Well, they're great. And I thank you again for this opportunity. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you so much for that question, Nancy. Um, and thanks for that answer, Hearn. The next question is going to be from Naomi. Naomi, I'm going to give you a chance to unmute. Hello, um, Hearn. It's wonderful to hear you talk about your work and see so much of it. And um, hi. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so uh, I was curious about uh, how you felt about collaboration uh, with the dance, uh, you know, with uh, David Grenke mm -hmm. uh, and how the process worked for you. And did you have some back and forth and did he ask you to create certain things for the dance or was it pretty much that he looked from uh, at what you had and just chose certain things? It was it was very much uh, the latter. He he's been very easy to work with because he hasn't tried to. Uh, we haven't had any ego clashes about what we want and what what's going to happen. Uh, he's been uh, very uh, supportive of uh, you know his interest in what I'm doing, and so we've just uh, I let him arrange the stuff and uh, and he's can he's his dancers are free to do whatever they want. But we aren't really. I'm hoping that as since this is actually going to happen, I, I was really surprised at the beginning. I didn't know if we were going to get anywhere with a collaboration. But now that we're doing something, maybe we will have a reason to, you know, maybe he'll suggest something and I'll come back with something and we can get more of a dialogue going. But yeah, right, would, you, would you welcome that? I was just curious because um, you had. Sure. Uh, yeah, I, I just from what I talked to him, you know, he's got a lot of ideas that are aligned with mine, but he comes at it from this choreographic point of view. He uses terms that uh, about dance and the way he's going to use the dancers and everything. And so I feel like I could learn a lot from thinking further about, I, you know, I talk about how I'm related to three dimensional space, but I, I took dance classes uh, long, long ago and I haven't gone back and tried to do any of it myself. So I'm, I'm, I'm really just sort of uh, beginning to think more about it. I, I just wanted to connect it with what you said about constraints and breaking your own constraints, you know, and things that you've done a certain mm -hmm. way in the past and uh, trying to break free of that and find some new ways. And so maybe this would be like in line with that, except it would be ex external constraints. So, right. I mean, I could see after we, after we do this, I could see maybe coming up with some ideas of mine to funnel what I'm doing more in a direction that would be, um, related to you know his interests and 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 towards a performance that would uh maybe uh get more uh layers going in an interesting way and in, in dialogues between the visual and the and the physical movement thank so. you so much naomi for that question um and thank you Hearn, for for your replies um the next question is going to be from Emily, Emily, I'm going to give you the chance to unmute to ask your question now. Hi, I um, I wanted to thank Hearn for um, showing the, these rich images. They really do translate on the computer. Um, and I had a lot of thoughts while you were talking. Um, and maybe I can I can say some of that and then turn it. You know, I mean, I I can also have a question at the same time. And that is that, um, I, I love that quote about the vertical and the horizontal. And that the, um, because for me, the vertical is about, it's not only about life, but it's also about reaching up. And the horizontal is not only about lying down, but it's about connecting in the in the whole world, right? So if you if you draw a line straight and if you keep going, you eventually come back to the beginning, which will be the circle of the world. Um, but the when you were talking about your collages and your paintings, one of the things that really um, impressed me was that that it goes back to when we were at the studio school in Paris together and kind of um, parsing our way through understanding space. Mm -hmm. And the paint collages really feel like um, it's a it's a tactile language. It's an abstract language. And then when you work from life, it really feels like um, it's a, it's an analytic. It's the analytical part of your mind, and that is another language that is in some ways a kind of it. The two of them together um, are like a binary opposition, mm -hmm. and that you keep playing the right against the left mm -hmm. in a way, um, and and that the that the space that you're trying to um place these color pieces in are really like you're choosing colors because of where they are in space 
and of course, how much light they reflect. But that is a way of touching the space that you cannot normally touch. So I was just wondering if any of this um, was in sync with what you were thinking about. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that uh, the idea of touching the, the, the collage, I think, is just a, an extra tactile thing. I make the painting and then I put the paper on it, you know, and it's feeling mm -hmm. like I'm uh, really directing my attention to something. And uh, yeah, the, the the tension between the analytical and the, the physical, um, I mean, that goes through, you know, when I get distracted by Meyer Shapiro and start thinking about art history, and then I go back and I want to paint. And Gustin and Shapiro are kind of the opposite poles in a way. Uh, so I've, I, I try to reconcile that. I should say Emily has a great show that's up right now in Chelsea, and uh, I was afraid she was going to ask me something about Francois Cheng, who I guess you're not related to, right? But that's... The <laughs> no, I'm not, but I, I did have a thought, which I, I went to the uh, China Institute last night, and they have a show of the details of bird and um, flower paintings, which is a whole mm -hmm. genre in itself. But uh, listening to the um, curator talk, I realized that, um, you know, that Chinese painting really um, requires of you to bring your sensitivity down, like when you were talking about the negative space, right? And if you can't match that sensitivity, you will just run over it. Mm -hmm. So that, um, that um, in, in like, I'll just throw this out. In the Yuan Dynasty, there was a painter, Huang Gong Huang, who was one of the four great masters. And he always talked about Chinese landscape painting as like akin to tea that tea was something that was to be tasted and very very subtle and he said anybody can do um a landscape painting that's flashy or that's um you know kind of has gimmicks in it but very few people can paint a, the blandness of the world around them right mm -hmm. and so um that's a great I, idea <laughs> yeah and i was thinking like oh my god i feel I feel like a clod moving through the earth without, you know, that that I have to bring myself back to the sensitivity of 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 looking and touching and feeling. And I think your work is a really great example of somebody who's actively engaged with the um the the minute the minute steps that you take to become that way. Thanks so much. Or going back to Wayne Tebow's thing about the nuances, the the realism, <laughs> nuances, shifting nuances rather than the big heroic thing. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Emily, for those questions. Um, and thank you, Hearn, again, for those replies. The last question today is for me. Um, Hearn, I was curious if you could speak about, you know, you've, you've contributed to the rail for a long time and, and written many reviews and had many great conversations in the rail. And I'm curious how your writing impacts your practice as an artist and also how your teaching has impacted your practice as an artist. Well, yeah, I, uh, Obviously, I, I I think after I, I gave up on doing art history after I got intimidated by Meyer Shapiro and thought, no, I'm not going to get to do that. I, I started developing writing as a as a way of uh, exploring some more, my more analytical, as we were saying, analytical intellectual side. I could write, and I I enjoyed writing. I had I had uh, spent a lot of time studying literature before I got into art, so I um, I, I like. The opportunity to uh, that I've enjoyed with the rail to write about things that interest me, and uh, it's always a hard decision to know what to write about uh, because so many things uh, inspire my attention. But I and I realize how little I know, <laughs> which makes you realize that you're kind of skating along very uh, thin ice sometimes. Uh, but uh, but I, but I think well certainly like the thing I, I did recently with Gabriel Orozco really came out of. Uh, I got interested in his work. I went to see a show in London. I came back and I wrote about it. And then uh, the gallery wanted to do an interview. So I, uh, it was all a wonderful experience. It really enhanced my uh, my awareness of his work. And just, uh, well, he's very involved with Japanese stuff. And uh, it was all a uh, tremendous uh, intellectual experience. So that's been good. And with teaching too, I should say at, uh, at, at UC Davis, which is very involved with, you know, making stuff, uh, ceramics and painting, and hopefully they will continue doing that. Uh, I was never, uh, I, I was given the opportunity to teach courses that I wanted to teach and that I could uh, develop my ideas, especially about American art. I taught uh, some courses about the sense of place in American art, which led, which were developing out of, uh, 
again, the students living in suburbs. And I'm saying, you know, nobody lives where they grew up anymore. Nobody stays where they live. They move somewhere else into a new place. And it's generally recently built. And how do you, how do you make that feel like a, a place to you? And, you know, you develop narratives or visual things. So that's why I'm looking at the sidewalks, you know, the most everyday mundane things, which are, um, the California thing is like post, you know, the modernist grid. And then you add a lot of Asian landscaping to it. They put in the gravel and the rocks and everything out there because that's easy to water. <laughs> so yeah, they've been, uh, I've been very happy with the way I've been able to do all these different things that interest me. Thanks, Hearn. Um, while I was asking you my question, Barbara Grossman asked uh, if you could talk a bit about memory, visual and emotional memory. Barbara, do you want to be unmuted to, to expand on your question? Okay. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara wants to talk. <laughs> I, I just, well, I've been, this is an ex, a, a very, uh, a very uh, exciting a conversation because the visual is something that I'm very attached to. Um, and one of the things that um, Mayor, the Mayor Luponti notion and the, the idea of visual perception is that the minute we look at something and stop looking at something, it becomes memory. Mm -hmm. It's no longer concrete. Mm -hmm. And so in a way, when you put down those marks, they're based on that fraction of a second of memory. And mm -hmm. I, I'm wondering, you know, if you think about that, if you have some kind of emotional attachment to it, because these, uh, I'm making a, a leap here, but I think of Mondrian and his, uh, his journey from working directly from nature to the, the, the cross the plus and minus marks, then to the, ge the pure geometry. And I, I can see that there is a a connection to that kind of thinking. Yeah, well, there's a lot. Uh, your your question kind of raises a lot of things about memory, and uh, I, I know uh, I had a discussion with Wayne Tebow actually, who who didn't think we should work perceptually so much. He was much more in favor of memory, and uh, he called it the headlong. He said an artist who's working perceptually, they see this, they see that, they put that in, they put that in, they accumulate all this stuff. And, uh, and they never step back and just look and, and see what the painting really needs. So I've been sensitive to that and I try and I spend a lot of time just kind of looking at things in the studio and then taking them back out to work on them. And um, that idea about the memory being necessarily involved in, in the fact that you're, you're always going back and forth between looking at things. Um, Wayne used to say Degas had this idea that the model would be in one room and the painting would be in another or upstairs and you would run to the other place and then paint, then go back and look at the model. And uh, Degas was much of also a believer in memory. As, and I love the idea of memory as a, uh, I, I'm uh, very, you know, subjectively oriented, I guess you'd say. And I, I think uh, I, I think a lot, I spent a lot of time in memories. And uh, I, I think memory, you know, distills and, and makes pro more profound your experiences if you can um, get into that. I don't well, know if that's answering your question exactly. Yes, it does. It confirms the notion that Kajori always spoke about is that when we, we look at something, our eyes are never static. Mm -hmm. that, that in, order, in order to see things, our eyes are constantly moving. If they're static, then they're staring and we're not really seeing anything. Right. So that, that confirms that whole, the physical idea of observation with the the emotional and physical notion of trying mm. to capture it in a way. Yeah, I, and I, I think that's what your work is so much about. And thank mm. you for spending the time with us. Okay, well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. I enjoyed conversation. So thank, thank you, you Chloe, for <laughs> making you. it possible. Yeah, no, that was a that was an amazing question to end on. Thank you, Barbara, for that. Um, and thank you, Hearn, again for for so generously answering it. At the rail, we have a tradition of ending our community events with a poetry reading. And today I'm thrilled to welcome our poet laureate of the day, Simon Pettit, to the stage. English-born poet Simon Pettit is a longtime resident of New York's Lower East Side 
Hearth, his collected poems, appeared in 2010, and As a Bee appeared recently from Talisman. He's compiled and edited the selected art writings of the New York School poet James Schuyler and co-edited Other Flowers, Schuyler's posthumous poems. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Simon. Uh, hi, folks. Uh, Aaron, that was so stimulating, so interesting. Uh, I too much, too much I can, for me to say right now, but thank you so much for that. Um, I'm going to turn the corner. Why be blue, sky be gray, heart be heavy now, contrariness be not necessary, obstinacy be damned. I'm going to sit right here and whistle. Why, why be blue, sky be gray, heart be heavy now, contrariness be not necessary. Obstinacy be damned. I'm going to sit right here and whistle. I was working with uh, or, or looking at the, uh, this, in the studio of the painter Mimi Gross, familiar with many of you, I'm sure, and who also is working with dance, uh, working with the Douglas Dunn Dance Company here in New York, and most recently uh, made a beautiful uh, uh, performance, um, which included a lot of flowers. And I came looking in the studio and I started looking at these, these uh, little flower 3D creations that she'd made for the set. And it's the dynamic between dance and painting and sculpture and, and, and music and poetry uh, fascinates me. So it was very interesting to hear her and talking about a little bit of this today. So this is called Feel Good. Feel Good for Mimi Gross. Feel Good. Wanting to grasp something of joy, given the almost interminable and ever-growing suffering which saps the will and wants to invade everything. Why not a bouquet of flowers, soppily blossoming in all directions? Wanting to grasp something of joy, given the almost interminable and ever-growing suffering which saps the will and wants to invade everything. Why not a bouquet of flowers soppily blooming in all directions? And uh, one more color poem, uh, just to make that uh, theme. Our, so, Poems called for, for Joe. It's dedicated to a, a young friend. Our purpose is crescendo of color. We don't pretend to be anything. We are already here, fully formed, manifest, astonished. Our, our, our purpose is crescendo of color. We don't pretend to be anything, we're already here, fully formed, manifest, astonished. And I'll, I'll conclude with the with the this little few poems that uh, were in the current rail, <laughs> the Brooklyn rail, uh, and I'd like to uh, uh, close. Actually, I, in so doing, I close on a, on a slightly uh, uh, angry note and that's so not my my feeling right now i'm very pleased to be with you all <laughs> these are winter poems uh, snow crystallized on the bedroom window winds howling whistling frightening old building shakes winter pandemonium you're up on the 24th floor Stay safe, precious love of my life. It will pass. We all pass. Easily. Equilibrium. Swiftly. From the savage night to the placid day. Can, to, can, can, you, can you come soon? It will be soon. To a place that resembles nothing 
as much as a monastery or prison. Neglectful I am, abandoned, without your warm cowl. I shiver with cold each night, without your warm cowl. I shiver with cold each night. Snow, snow crystallized on the bedroom window. Winds howling, whistling, frightening. Old building shakes, winter pandemonium. You are up on the 24th floor. Stay safe, precious love of my life. It will pass. We all pass easily. Equilibrium swiftly from the savage night to the placid day. C can you can you come soon? It will be soon to a place that resembles nothing as much as a monastery or prison. Neglectful I am, abandoned without your warm cowl. I shiver with cold each night. Three. Gus asks me questions, assertive to hide his own duplicity. I don't trust him as far as I can spit. Gus asks me questions, assertive to hide his own duplicity. I don't trust him as far as I can spit. Why be blue? Why be blue? Sky be grey, heart be heavy now. Contrariness be not necessary. Obstinacy be damned. I'm going to sit right here and whistle. Thank you. Simon, thank you so much. That was an amazing conclusion to today's event. Thank you for reading today. And thank you, of course, again to Amanda and to Hearn for, for today's really wonderful and generous dialogue. Um, thank you to the team at Bowery Gallery as well. And we'd also like to thank the Terra Foundation for American Art, who sponsor our NSC program and make daily conversations like this one possible, and for their support of our growing arch archive, which you can view on the Rails YouTube channel. For 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has provided a platform for the arts, culture, and politics through our free monthly publication and public events like this one, our daily NSC. You can check the chat for a link to donate to support the Rail. And if you're free on Monday at 1 p.m., join us as we celebrate our 900th NSE and Mark DeSubero's 90th birthday with a conversation with Jed Morse, Ivana Mestrovic, Stephen Henry, and G Jessica Holmes about Mark DeSubero painting and sculpture on view now at Paula Cooper Gallery here in New York. We'll conclude with a reading by Garrett Caples. And as is rail tradition, you can now turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you so, so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you so much. You. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank